the uh, thank you recording in progress uh, the talking today is going to be done by a very special person who many of you will know very well why because he's he's in charge of quite uh, quite a bit of the teaching in the whole of India now. He's taken over quite a lot of the neonatal teaching, not just ultrasound, but general neonatal teaching. He's regularly on the news. He's published books. He's done much research, many articles. He's a professor in his university. Uh, in his clinical role, he uh, doesn't just go to one hospital. He covers up, and Pradeep, you'll have to correct me here, about uh, four to seven different hospitals, if not more, where he goes out and he visits all those hospitals on a daily basis and he keeps in touch with all the doctors at those hospitals. So he's got a far reach in terms of clinical role and he teaches all of his juniors uh, very intensely with, uh, uh, in terms of ultrasound and many other things. So we are very honored to have Professor Pradeep Surya once she talk to us now. On, a, uh, uh, on the role of neonatal lung ultrasound. So thank you, Pradeep, I'll leave that to you. Pradeep, I can't um, hear you, you may need to unmute young, yourself. Young, my slides visible and am I audible? Yes, I can hear you now and your slide is perfect. So thank you, it's all good. So thank you, it's off to predict, uh, Professor Surya Wanshi from Pune. He's gonna talk to us on lung ultrasound. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jan, for this um, kind introduction. And uh, I think uh, whatever you talked about, uh, the teaching, spreading of the knowledge, India owes to Jan Klimek because we started our journey of focus along with Jan in 2003 in Sydney, Australia, and the same journey we continued in India since 2010, and now it's still ongoing. And hence, I think uh, Sydney has played a very important role in development of the focus in Indian NICUs. So with this uh, introduction, my city, as you all know, is a Pune, which is a part of the Maharashtra state but the Pune is famous for education hub. It is called as the East of Oxford. And it was the capital of Maratha Empire in 18th century of India. I belong to the uh, university, which is a Bharti Vidyapit University Medical College. And we run a super specialty course of a DM neonatology. So this lecture has been designed by my team of a DM neonatology team along with the resource persons which are working with me for the last 10 years. So today we will like to cover the lung ultrasound with the basics in the form of indications, performance of lung ultrasound, the basics of A lines and B lines, naturally additional artifacts, and then we will go to the specific condition. I know a lot of people are already doing very good work in lung ultrasound, but some of the people or probably the audience is 50-50% here. So what I will try to cover, we will cover the basics and as well as the current aspect in the next 45 to 50 minutes. So let's see about the uh, some part of the basics of introduction. As we know, when we talk about the ultrasound beams, Naturally, we are talking about the tissue penetration and those beams reflecting back through the transducer. And when we see the image on the screen, that's a, a transducer, what we see the reflection of the image on the screen. So our interpretation of that skin image is a reconstruction of these ultrasound beams which penetrate. That's what we all know about the basics about any ultrasound principles. But what happens in the lung ultrasound, which is a different than the routine penetration? Because the ultrasound beams, they cannot penetrate air, and it is actually the reflection of the artifacts. Machine has a picture, 
and that picture is actually the artifact so what we are interpreting in lung ultrasound is the pattern of these artifacts so remember when we are actually visualizing the image it is the artifact produced by these lung ultrasound beams and those appears on the screen and that gives you as a picture and that's what we are going to interpret actually the lung ultrasound if you see the history wise since last two decades it's been in good shape but in the last decade it has taken a very proper shape in the neonatal medicine various committees have a basic pro forma that what are the terminologies we should use from the neonatal perspective so let's see some of these uh, standard definitions and the basic introduction part of the lung ultrasound now if you see the last 10 years almost every month you will find one or two papers in a good journals about lung ultrasound and that has so much picked up in the last 5 years that the articles which were around 20s to 40 now you see almost 300 to 400 articles in a very good journals about focus neonatal lung ultrasound what we are expecting from the focus my humble request to all of you is that first always clinical examination focus is going to guide us or advance us from clinical to the additional information so the clinical information is very important from that clinical information we will add some image information and then we'll go forward the focus helps for the guiding the respiratory support decision about the surfactant therapy repeat surfactant treatment progress of the respiratory illness and the two most important conditions that's pneumothorax and pleural effusion diagnostic as well as thorax, uh, therapeutic so this is where the sensitivity and specificity of the focus is very good and very easy very quick bedside less time naturally when the baby deteriorates you are going to utilize the focus and find out the points which are useful for the baby with a sudden deterioration so the points what are the points we are going to perform on the lung ultrasound most important is the transducer as we all know we are going to utilize the high frequency uh, linear transducer if we have the hockestic transducer which has a more frequency probably 12 to 18 megahertz frequency then it is much better but if you have linear also that's acceptable but those machines which have a with hockey stick you get a better image quality naturally in a short time we'll cover that we have a mainly the perpendicular image position with the marker on the cranial side we can have a parallel to the chest wall marker on right or left side according to the right or left lungs which are straining this is the hockey stick we can utilize again the advantage of the hockey stick is that you can have a small footprint and better image because of the high frequency as a superficial structures we can have a six region approach or we can have a 12 region approach when the smaller baby especially lbw babies we can have the anterior lateral and the posterior similarly on the right side and left side as a six region approach of the screening or you can think about the 12 region approach as anterior upper and lower lateral upper and lower posterior upper and lower right and left side that's what we consider as the approach of a 12 region the trans diaphragmatic when we consider about the uh, trans diaphragmatic here that's the best for a pleural effusions which are important when we consider about diagnosing pleural effusion or a therapeutic pleural effusions you should have a some format of documentation we would prefer that when we consider about the documentation we can we can think about the measuring as right left and various regions whether you are using six 
region approach or the 12 region approach. Now let's come to the basics about the image and interpretation of that image in a, a normal babies and some abnormal signs. These are the three important lines what we all need to have. One is a plural line, A lines and B lines. This is the anatomical structure of what the chest wall we can consider as we know the skin subcutaneous tissue, the ribs and the intercostal muscles, pleura and the lung. This is what the basic what we are considering. Thank you. So that's a, that's an anatomical chest wall. If you convert that anatomical chest wall into the gray skin, the beauty of the lung ultrasound is that you play with the most of the time gray skin. Very rarely you require a mode and color Doppler. Most of the interpretation is on the gray skin. So when you have the interpretation as a skin and subcutaneous tissue, you will have an ecogenic what we can consider as the, these are the ribs, then the pleural line, and then comes to the A lines. So let's, let's see one by one. These pleural lines just concentrate. The pleural lines, these are the thin. They are regular hyperechoic lines less than 0.5 millimeter located below the ribs. So you see these ones? And they basically are the part of the parietal pleura. They usually have a to and fro movements. So usually we'll have a to and fro movements on the pleural line. And that is one of the important sign, which is called as a lung sliding. So what we saw here, we saw the skin. We saw the skin subcutaneous tissue. We have a ribs and we have this ecogenic pleural line. Naturally, we'll come to the A lines also once we discuss the next slide. So the pleural line is the most ecogenic line when you have the first image or observation. Now the A lines, these A lines are the artifacts caused by the plural line. So that's a plural line. And you see this horizontal ecogenic parallel line to the plural line. These parallel lines, they are called as A line. A line indicates physiological air or pathological air. And the distance between these two plural lines is always equal. So very simple, very easy. The beauty of the lung ultrasound is that it's very easy to interpret, very easy to learn, and less, less views as compared to your cranial ultrasound as compared to echocardiography or as compared to the gut ultrasound. The lung is the easiest ultrasound for interpretation of the image. The next line you need to see here, after once you saw the plural line, now you see these vertical laser-like hyperechoic lines. These vertical hyperechoic lines, they move along with the lung sliding. They represent the alveolar gas liquid interface. So A lines, we discuss about the uh, plural and air liquid. Here we are discussing about the uh, liquid interface. In the normal physiological babies, in the first 24 to 48 hours, you will see these B lines and they disappear as we know the transition from opening of the lungs from fluid to air. That's a normal transition of a normal newborn. You can see now this small artifact, this small short artifacts, they weak, they don't reach to the, they don't reach to the actually end of the screen. They are very short, they weaken once they go back and they also move and there is no replacement of A lines. These are called as a comet tails. They are short. These are not to be confused with the B lines. So when we consider about these comet tails, again, they represent a small fluid into the lung. If you compare the comet tail versus B line, they are less equic, while the B lines are naturally more equic. They are ill-defined as compared to well-defined B lines. They vanishes, they are only two to four centimeter, while the B lines 
is actually up to the edge of the screen. Comet tails actually they don't move the lung sliding while the B lines with the lung sliding. So those are the things what we consider. Now let's discuss about the B lines. B lines has a various patterns when there is a more fluid where the increasing amount of fluid. These are the incremental changes we'll see. So let's discuss about the simple B lines. When you have a vertical path, two to three per intercostal space, and you can also see your A lines. So you see this one, that's the first thing what you identify is a plural line. After the plural line, you identify what you see these are the a B line vertical lines. And in between these ones, these are the rib shadows. So what we told you that these are two to three B lines in this one, one space. And these where you will see the rib spaces in between, you will have some form of A lines, which are the parallel to the plural line. They don't erase. These are the simple B lines, which are the small amount of fluid. Now, from simple B lines, what is a confluent B line? Now we are talking about entire space filled up with these lines. So you see now, this entire space is a, actually the confluent. And these space, there are intercostal lines. There are in between these intercostal shadow, this is the rib shadow, this is the rib shadow is still there. And this intercostal space is a filled up with these B lines. That is called as a confluent B lines. From confluent B lines, let's discuss about alveolar interstitial syndrome, where more than three confluent B lines in one lung scan region you will see. So we saw simple B lines. From B lines, we shifted to the confluent B lines. Now let's see from confluent B lines to the A, what is we called as AIS. So you see now there is a rib shadow. And these are more than three in one region of the scan. And they are filled or the compact or confluent one. So these are more than three. These are called as alveolar interstitial syndrome, more and more fluid accumulation, more transition. This is what we go from step by step. So you see comparison of the confluent B lines versus AIS simplifies that you have more than three intercostal space with a confluent B lines. Now from these confluent B lines, let's think about the compact B lines. The compact B lines, now they fuse together. They erase all A lines. And you see that now these, these are the one which are the confluent, from confluent to the AIS and this AIS now you can't see the rib shadows. All the rib shadows gone, A lines gone, going towards the more white out lung. So this is the transition, what we call simple B lines to the confluent B lines, to the AIS, to the compact B lines. Once there is a worsening, naturally we end up with a total white out. What the typical X-ray is, what X-ray white out we see. Similarly, we also see the white out lung into this lung ultrasound and this white out you can as easily picked up on the lung ultrasound very easy so if i go back to the if i go back to this simple slide where you see that rib shadows are there more than two more than three is total rib shadows gone total a line is gone and it becomes total white out these are the incremental changes of the b lines now let's see the other artifacts. We saw the plural line. We interpreted the A lines as a parallel to the plural lines. We documented about the B lines as a simple line. Then we jumped to the basically the, the confluent AIS, the compact and white lung. Now let's see some of the additional thing which already have, I have shown you is the lung sliding. The lung sliding is that the movement of the plural line during the respiration as the movement of the chest wall. So it looks like the lung is sliding on that plural. And that's the normal lung feature. It has to be present. And that's the first thing when we interpret our lung ultrasound is lung sliding present or absent. That is very important. Lung sliding visualization by grayscale, 
by actual video is very important. So just now I all repeated, I showed you that the lung is sliding, lung is moving, and the pleural line, you can observe. That's very important aspect of the first normal lung ultrasound feature. The second one is the spared areas. Now, you see here, this is the normal A-line pattern, the plural line, the parallel A-lines, and these are the B-line, which you can see that two to three patterns of the confluent which are going towards the AIS, but this area is spared. This area is not involved. So in the total lung region, this area, almost two third is been B lines and one third is around A lines. So this area is normal area. So that is called as a, a spared area and which is the characteristic features of meconian aspiration syndrome. We'll discuss when we come to the MAS. What about lung consolidation? When it comes to the developing countries, this is very important, very, very, very useful parameter. When we are in the periphery of the CT and we have ultrasound machine and you can pick up without less training, these hepatization, these consolidation, and you can start baby immediate treatment and that is going to be helpful in the future also. So the lung consolidation means the lung looks like liver. The lung tissue is changing like hepatization as a, as a, a density wise with air bronchograms or fluid bronchograms. And these consolidations are the most important feature when we talk about the RDS, pneumonias, and atelectasis. Without these ones, we are not able to document these diagnoses, so it is very important. So you see now, what I'm talking here, this is the area which I'm talking as hepatization of the lung. And I'll come back to this sign, which when we discuss about the lung consolidation, which is also called as the Schrader sign. That means the border of this lung consolidation looks like as a shred and echogenic and the, the border of the pneumonia looks like these irregular borders. So that is the word area of the lung consolidation and the shred sign. This is the normal lung, what we see. These are the two confusing terminologies you will encounter when you read some lung ultrasound points. One is a double lung point and lung point. So what is a double lung, and point, lung point? Now double lung point is the characteristic features of a transient tachypnea of newborn. The upper lung field, they are looking like a normal A-line pattern and the lower lung field, which looks like the B-line pattern or AIS pattern, in between these upper and lower, you will find a point. That point is called as a double lung point. When you see such scans, it is very useful that you are dealing a baby who might not require the surfactant therapy. This is very useful when you start your screening of babies who are late preterm, early term. This is the very useful identity for labeling the baby and the need of the support. So this is what we are talking about the lung point. Upper lung field is a normal pattern. Lower lung field is a B-line pattern. While we talk about the only lung point, now the lung point is the a characteristic features of the pneumothorax. In the lung point, the point between, the area between the presence of the lung sliding, presence of the lung sliding and absence of the lung sliding. So please watch here. This is the lung area, which has a lung sliding present. You can just um, uh, put this one. This is a lung sliding present and this area, which is lung sliding is absent. So these are the two points, this point and these two points. These two points are important points, what we called as the lung point. And the lung point is a specific sign of a pneumothorax and it is very useful very important for picking up of pneumothorax. The two more signs are the, what we call as the sandy beach sign and barcode sign. These two signs, again, the specific for diagnosing the pneumothorax. The sandy beach sign is the normal sign of a normal lung, where you will see that if I put M mode on this normal lung, the part of the lung looks like the sand-like beach. If I put M mode 
onto the abnormal lung where the air is accumulated, where the lung sliding is absent, where the B lines are absent, and abnormal A lines are present. It looks like a mode looks like a barcode, and that is called as a barcode sign. So what we are talking is a normal lung as the uh, Sandebich sign, while the abnormal lung of a pneumothorax is a barcode sign. With this background of the last 20 minutes, let's discuss next 15 minutes some of the decisions which are useful in our day to day practice. It is not feasible to cover all the aspects, but I'm trying to cover are important which are useful for us in day to day practice. So let's discuss the commonest thing what we encounter is the respiratory distress syndrome. The commonest features of the lung ultrasound on the RDS is a subpleural consolidation. It has to be there. It has to be present along with the pleural line abnormality with white lung, diffuse white lung. If you have these three features in lung ultrasound, your sensitive specificity is 99 to 100% very important features of RDS when we talk about the lung ultrasound. So if you see now here, you have the pleural line, which is abnormal. This is a thin pleural line or non-visualized pleural line. These are the subpleural consolidation. You can see these subpleural consolidation here in this picture, which are the characteristic features of RDS. It has to be there. And white out lung. You can't see the rib shadows, and you will see the a total lung, which is looking like white. So this is the picture of a 26 weeker or 25 weeker immediately at what you can consider at the 30 minutes of the life. Naturally, when you think about this picture, immediately you think about the surfactant therapy. And this is the picture after four hours transition from what we consider as the B line pattern to the A line pattern. That's the beauty of the lung ultrasound is that you can get immediately pictures in hardly 30 seconds. You don't require more than one minute and you don't require too much training. That's the beauty of lung ultrasound. Hence, I would say that this is a part of the routine day-to-day -day, uh, training of the focus in neonatal curriculum now. Now let's discuss about the, some of the very important papers published in the recent last five years about the lung ultrasound scores and the need of the surfactant. The Professor Bratt uh, uh, and uh, basically the France team, they have done a lot of work on this one as the Professor uh, Daniel De Luca. They have distributed these lungs into the three regions, right side three and left side three regions. After scanning, they have given the scores as a normal lung A line pattern as a zero score, B line pattern from fluid to air as a one score, white out lung as a two score, and hepatization with a straight sign as a consolidation area as a score three. When they have compared the scores and need of the surfactant, what they found out this is the area of under curve in a babies who are less than 34 weeker and more than 34 weeker. The first paper, they com commented that in the babies with the more than 34 weekers, if your score is more than two, it is a good predictive value as the sensitivity and the specificity is around 90% of sensitivity. Area under the curve is 0.71. You can think about surfactant therapy. If your baby is less than 34 weeker and your lung ultrasound score is, is four, naturally the area under the core is 0.83 with the sensitivity of 100% and sensitivity of 61%, then you can think about those in these babies of surfactant therapy. Another recent paper about the surfactant in extremely preterm babies. So the paper first was about 34 weeks and less than 34 weeks. This was a more specific paper where they compared less than 28 weeker and more than 28 weeker. And you see the area of under curve. If you see this one, the surfactant treatment the first dose, if it is more than six, you have a negative predictive value is around 88. More than eight, it's around 83. And retreatment of the surfactant, score more than 10 is a very good. So what these scores have added, these scores have given a good prediction about the need of the surfactant, about the need of the resurfactant. That was, again, 
from the professor uh, Daniel Diluca team from the France, what they have done. So in this ELBW, the area of under curve was 0.94. And if you compare less than 28 and more than 28 weaker, it was very good 0.93 and 0.98. And that has represented a very good value. And the people have gone one step ahead and they are now trying to see open up the lung or distended lungs comparison. Currently, the studies are going on. Now, the people have also compared about the after surfactant, the lung ultrasound score. So the ROC curve on this one that the surfactant images change after two hours of surfactant administration. And you can identify the need of the surfactant of a second dose. The score greater than seven, a good sensitivity of 90% with needed to predictive value of 95%. So these are the important things which are going on currently about the lung ultrasound scores and the need of the surfactant. This was the one more paper about comparison of the lung ultrasound to the X-ray. A lot of people say that, oh, I have done the ultrasound and I'm also doing the X-ray. Now, virtually a lot of units are shifting towards the lung ultrasound. They are reducing the radiation. They are decreasing the need of the X-rays by doing the lung ultrasound, which is very easy, which is bedside, which is a, a less time part. In this paper also, they have shown that the lung ultrasound score was better for diagnosing the ideas than the X-ray. And the area of under curve was 0.94. Sensitivity was 86% and negative predictive value was 87%. So the lung ultrasound is better than the X-ray when you need to think about the surfactant. That's about the RDS. Let's discuss about the another common entity. Naturally, when we talk about the developing countries, a lot of time we struggle with the bed occupancy. We struggle with the availability of the level three beds. So this is a very good parameter. As a lung ultrasound, you can have these images and just immediately you can differentiate as whether I'm dealing with a baby of TTN or am I dealing with a baby who is worsening RDS? Because in the TTN, we just saw that we see the pattern of the fluids as a B line pattern. The mild TTNs will see the double lung points, while the severe TTN will end up with the AIS pattern or the or compact B line pattern. But the most important differentiating feature is here we will not see the consolidation. So, lung edema without consolidation you are towards the TDN. When you are talking about the lung edema, you are talking about the pleural line abnormalities and consolidation, you are talking about RDS. Naturally, the clinical history will also guide us. Always clinical history first, clinical examination first, then your focus lung ultrasound. These are the two important factors which are easy. I already shown you the uh, video about the, the upper lung field and the lower lung field and the double lung point as normal A-line pattern in the upper lung field and the fluid pattern of the B-line in the lower lung field in cases of the TTN. Also, you see that normal pleural line, no consolidation, no subpleural consolidation. There is a pattern of the AIS. This is the classic feature of the TTN, whether we are talking about the babies who are late preterm, early term, or term babies. This is very useful for definitely the uh, developing country scenarios or the babies with the growth restricted, where we can think about the need of surfactant. If you compare this TTN versus RDS, naturally, the lung sliding is always present in TTN. Lung sliding might be in some cases of the severe RDS might not be present. Plural thickening is always normal in TTN. The plural abnormalities are there in case of RDS. The B lines are present in TTN, while the B lines will be the, uh, the patterns of the B lines will be there. And the consolidation is always the hallmark. Without consolidation, we cannot diagnose the RDS. So what do we think about? We know that white out lung, pleural abnormalities, and consolidation, and the consolidation, these are the hallmarks what we talk about the TTM. Let's discuss about the pneumonia. This is the commonest diagnosis in the developing countries as compared to the RDS. We do have uh, very common findings in the first, within the early onset sepsis is pretty common. Congenital pneumonias are common when we talk about the developing countries. And in that, 
the lung consolidation, which we call hepatization of a varying size, that's the most important landmark with or without air and fluid bronchograms, with the sign, that's a classic feature of the pneumonia when we want to diagnose. And this is very important for developing countries. Very, very useful, very easy. Immediately you can start your antibiotic treatment and this is life-saving. That is what the pneumonia had changed in the most of the developing countries, the outcomes of the babies. Pleural line abnormalities and later on disappearance of lung sliding, these are additional points. So if you see, just now we discussed about the, what we talked about, the hepatization, that is a consolidation. And we also talked about the, the shear sign when we discuss about the borders of the consolidation, which are irregular and they are the consolidation, abnormal pleural line, and some babies will have absent lung sliding. So you see this baby, which came from the outside and within, within admission, immediately after admission, you diagnose this consolidation. We immediately, within the, probably you don't require more than one minute. And with this one minute, you can give your antibiotics within 10 minutes. And that is a life saving for what we talk as a life saving measure because of the neonatal lung focus. Most of the x rays, it takes 10 minutes to 30 minutes. In a good centers also, yes, between five to 10 minutes, but lung ultrasound takes hardly one minute maximum two minutes when you want to have a screening of these regions. We do see in Indian scenario that we also end up with these ones, what we call as the lung abscess. So if you see this video that the severe version of what we are talking as the babies with the, coming to the NICUs at late onset three weeks with liquefaction. So with this liquefaction, this is a massive, massive lung abscess and that turned out to be the uh, staphylococcus. So MRSA or the Klebsiella, these are common in developing countries. So if you see these three common conditions, which we encounter in developing countries, the RDS, TTM, and the pneumonia, what we are talking as a consolidation with abnormal pleural line and white out lung. We talk about the normal pleural line, no consolidation, double lung point, and AIS for TTM. We talk about the hepatization of the lung, shred sign in cases of the consolidation. In cases of the pneumonia, these are the very important when we talk about the Indian scenario or we are talking about developing scenario. Another common condition is the meconium aspiration. Again here is important feature is a consolidation. That means hepatization with or without air bronchogram with the shred sign. But the one important thing we need to have here is a spared areas. That means some areas of the lung will be normal in between because of the opening of the lungs. As we all know, there is the areas of the collapse, areas of the inflations. That's the features of the meconium aspiration. There could be the abnormal airlines, but I must openly say that it is very difficult to differentiate these meconiums from plain pneumonia. Hence, history is very important here. Once you have history about prenatal history and you know that the baby has the meconium, then you can easily diagnose. But if you don't have history and then you are very confusing because this also looks like classic pneumonia, straight sign, hepatization, some fluid of neural effusion. But if I have a history and these features, then I can diagnose the meconium aspiration. So I must say that meconiums and pneumonias, yes, it's a difficult, but the history plays very important role. Hence, history has to be there when we talk about these conditions or any lung conditions, history is paramount important. What about pneumothorax? The pneumothorax and pleural effusion, these two diagnoses is must for lung ultrasound for any neonatologist. The pneumothorax diagnosis is by the lung point, we discuss the lung point and the area which is affected where the lung sliding will be absent. The pleural line will not be visualized. Absent B lines and pathological A lines. And just we showed the barcode sign. So if you see, there is the absent lung, basically the lung point will be there and absent lung sliding. So just now we saw previously in this baby, 
this is the A line pattern and this is the B line pattern. And this turned out to be the, what we call lung point because there is no lung sliding here. In cases of the double lung point, the lung sliding is present. There is a normal pleural line. In cases of the pneumothorax, you will see both the side lung point and you will have absent lung sliding. Very important features to differentiate. And that is the diagnostic feature, a specific sign, what we called as a lung point. Just now I showed you guys, this is what you can see now in the video. Here, this lung sliding is present, lung sliding is present, absent lung sliding in the affected area, A lines, and you can see here the B line on the unaffected area. So these are the important feature what we call as lung point, absent lung sliding, no B lines, pathological A lines. These are the important feature of a pneumothorax. 100%, 99% to 100% sensitivity and specificity, very important. Everybody should please learn this simple method for pneumothorax. This is what I told you about the M mode. This M mode, what we talk about the normal M mode through the B lines as a, what we called as a beach sign, sandy beach sign. While in the abnormal area, if you put your M mode, you will see the barcode sign. So this is again easy. We don't require too much views. It's on the same view what we require. The next diagnosis, which is also 100% important, which is also easily available by lung ultrasound is a pleural effusion. By the transdiaphragmatic, what we call transdiaphragmatic, that means your marker is towards the cranial side into the mid axial line, you will see the hypoechoic area between the chest wall and lung parenchyma. So most important here is the marker. You can use the, uh, you can use the linear probe or you can use the, um, again, I told you about the, <clears throat> the basically the, uh, the probes can be uh, changed, but hockey stick is better here. Marker towards the canal side. You will be seeing the normal kidney, liver, and the lung. These are the three structures in the mid axial line you will be able to see. Sometimes you might not see the kidney, but the liver and the lungs is very easily with the diaphragm. With this liver and the diaphragm, you will see the hypoechoic fluid where the lung is floating. So this hypoechoic fluid with the lung floating, what is the characteristic feature of this is the pleural effusion. So in this pleural effusion, when you put this one, you will, the peep, you will have some cord sign. Cord sign means quadrangular. You will have these two, basically the pleural line, upper and lower, and the side by side, the rib margins. This is called as a cord sign, as a hypoechoic area between the pleural line. That's the lung parenchyma, what you can easily diagnose as a pleural effusion. So you see this video where this is a, you can see the air bronchogram with hepatization of the lung. And this lung is floating. This is the point of the lung, which is called as a plaps point. And this hypoechoic fluid, which is the pleural effusion. The, this point floating into the fluid. You can see here the fibrinous material inside the fluid. That is what we call as the uh, synnemonic effusion, where the hepatization of the lung or consolidated lung is visualized very well. In Indian scenario, we do see the complicated pleural effusions because of the Klebsiella, because of the Acinobacter, and we do see the septations in the pleural effusions, and these are the common features as a severe pneumonia. Few slides about the uh, pulmonary hemorrhage in the next two, three minutes. This is also very important as the most important sign in the pulmonary hemorrhage, again, the clinical history with this red sign associated pleural effusion. So you should have a straight sign with the pleural effusion. Sometimes the fibrin band inside the pleural effusion. So you see this baby, where you see the straight sign, you see the abnormal pleural line, and you see the pleural effusion and some fibrin bands with the baby 24 weeker, with the history of pleural effusion. This is the classic feature of a pulmonary hemorrhage. Effusion, abnormal pleural line, straight sign, these are the classic features of pulmonary hemorrhage. If I see the atelectasis, 
again consolidation with the clear borders, but a static air bronchogram. Most of the previously what we saw the air bronchogram was actually the dynamic air bronchogram. While in this condition, you will see the uh, static air bronchograms and the pleural line abnormalities. This is the very, again, you see the, this is also happens like a pearl of collapse and you see the consolidation with the straight sign with, you will end up with the uh, static, air bronco, uh, static air bronchogram and increased blood flow to that area. So this is also very easy to pick up, very important finding when we consider about the lung atelectasis. Uh, I don't want to enter to this area, that's a radiologist area, but still just to show one slide as the uh, pulmonary airway malformation as a cystic lesions with the consolidation. So dear friends, these are the common things we can able to see in the lung ultrasound. This is the protocol prepared by uh, Professor Martin Klocko in 2016 and our uh, Indian team. And this was accepted by the Australian society and included in the CCPU as the part of the focus as the sudden collapse of the baby. So that's the cardiac as you all do, cranial ultrasound radius do. But when there is a baby deteriorates in lung ultrasound, you must do for pneumothorax effusion and consolidation. This is very mandatory when there is a sudden collapse of the baby. So these are the, these are the uh, training manuals basically is must be some modification, but this was along with the Professor Martin, what we discussed and we prepared this one in 2016. Recently, this is the recent publication in 2020, about safe heart protocol. That is a sonography in life-threatening emergency condition. And in that, along with the cardiac tamponade, once you have cardiac tamponade ruled out, you need to rule out your pneumothorax and pleural effusion. So these two things has to be ruled out. These are basically the pneumothorax on the basis of the lung sliding and the lung point and the pleural effusion on the basis of the hypoechocaria. So these are the two components included in the safe R protocols by Professor Daniel De Luca. These are the six points they have included, basically uh, five points included, and point number two, that is the marker position of the two or probe position of the two and probe position three, that's the lung area on the right and left and trans diaphragmatic for the pleural effusion. These are the two things included in the safe heart protocol. So friends, lung ultrasound is a point of care ultrasound, easy to learn, radiation free, quickly available, it is a repeatable. It's a serial lung ultrasound you can easily do. Yes, there are limitations. The studies, definitely we need to have more studies on the oral distension, finding about the atelectasis more, and the future will be the, again, the computerized analysis of the ultrasound images. So these are the future about the lung ultrasound, what we're talking. So if you summarize about the approach, the first important thing comes is the plural sliding present or absent. Once we say the plural sliding is absent and there is hypoechoic area, that's a plural effusion. Lung sliding, plural sliding is absent and the lung point is there, that's a pneumothorax. The plural sliding is present with pneumonia, that is a subplural pneumonia with white out lung, that's RDS. Lung sliding present with, with double lung point and AIS, that's a TTN. The lung sliding present with the stared area, that's a pneumonia, sorry, meconia aspiration, and hepatization of the lung and straight sign. These are the what we talk about the pneumonia. That's a simple approach with when we can consider about the differentiation. With this, I would say that lung ultrasound is very easy, very important. It has to be integrated in our day-to-day -day practice along with our clinical examination. What we learned in our medical school as inspection, palpation, percussion, auscultation, these are the four parameters we learned. But in insonation, that's the focus of, focus of the neonatal ultrasound is the fifth parameter, which has to be integrated along with our clinical history and examination. So the medical schools are there now. They are included this insonation as the ultrasound technology in our day-to-day -day practice. So the neonatal lung ultrasound is very easy, very important for decision-making. The serial ultrasounds are very useful rather than only one ultrasound. 
any focus has to be serial has to be for function has to be for decision making and that gives you a better idea definitely we don't have a long term study yet i do agree but again this is a recent technology the last 10 years neonatology has gained the momentum of lung ultrasound since 2000 adult medicine has gained but let's see in the future we have a more evidence about the long term studies about the neonatal focus also with this thank you friends thanks for patience hearing sorry i just have shoot up 2 to 3 minutes from my time but let's have a discussion uh, about the questions um, uh, dr yan uh, that's from my side fantastic so um uh, Professor Surya Wadji, that was such a nice thorough overview. I hope you can hear me. That was a thorough overview, not just of uh, the uses, but also uh, what the different lines mean and how to actually go about doing the scan and how to document the scan. I think that was very thorough. Thank you very much. And I'm very uh, impressed to see your interaction with uh, ASIM here in Australia and uh, Professor Krako in creating guidelines for our uh, trainees here. So that's really interesting to see as well. Thank you. There were some interesting questions. So I'll jump to those straight away now. Um, yeah. Thank you for all those who did ask questions. I'm going to combine some of them. So we've had an interesting, uh, I'm going to try looking at, uh, uh, looking at Hydropneumothorax, and uh, let me see who asked that, Dr. Samir Kumar Shah. Namaste, Dr. Shah. Um, he asked, what pattern is seen with hydropneumothorax? And I'll combine that with a question of any role in diagnosing loculated pleural effusion. So my guess would be that uh, you've already shown us the transdiaphragmatic uh, screening looking for the fluid, because the fluid would be, we assume it's dependent, so the fluid would go down to the bottom and air would go to the top. So with the hydropneumothorax, I'd expect fluid to go to the bottom. The lower lung fields, you see fluid, and the upper lung fields, you'll see air. Correct. So would, yeah. is that how you would answer that question? Yes. And yeah, maybe yeah. to explain yeah. more, and then talk about localization of uh, hydropneumothorax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, uh, thanks, to, um, uh, Dr. Yan and Samir. Basically, when we are dealing with these uh, fluid things, first thing, when you go from mid axillary from down to up, so down thing, you will see the a fluid which is a dependent area, which is down as the hypoechoic area. Naturally, you will not be able to visualize that hypoechoic area and upside. That is one. The second point is a loculated diffusion. When we are talking about the loculated, Anywhere, the septations, you see that effusion with the septations, and that is what, along with the syndemonic consolidation, those are the common features what we see in the cases of the loculated effusion or entity interns empyma, which are the uh, bad entities about the stap or clepsilla or acinobacter sepsis, uh, those ones. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to, uh, there was a question from uh, Dr. Tanya Mahal regarding, please could you elaborate on different lung segments? So you've shown us very nicely, you can do the anterior lateral and sometimes the posterior ones, depending on which uh, sequence you use and the sickness yeah. of the baby. Now we assume with uh, position and uh, uh, that there will be a dependent zone. So the, the lower zones will look different to the anterior. Could you tell us a little bit about the the different segments and how you interpret that and whether you score that differently. Yeah, so um, what we discussed, I think in the first 10 minutes, um, some, some might have joined late, but what we discussed is about the six region approach or we discuss about the 12 region approach. So we, we talked about the regions as the right side and left side, and we distributed those regions as upper and lower. So you are talking about the right upper and lower, axillary upper and lower, and posterior upper and lower. That could act as a 12 regions. Or if you consider becoming as a small, only one region, then anterior, lateral, and posterior, three on each side. If you then these regions, you go to the scores, then normal A line pattern, usually people use zero score. For a B line pattern is a one score, for AIS or white out lung, more than white out lung, two scores and hepatization consolidation as a three scores. And you document serially on each day 
that's what we do and documentation is very important probably that's what we need to do yeah thank you very much now um can i ask uh, in the audience i haven't got the full uh, pattern here is uh, dr trish woods uh, as part of the audience dr trish woods has created a lung ultrasound module for asm now and i wanted to ask her if um, she could give us an opinion from her side if she's with us is she uh, are you on trish okay while we're waiting i'm not sure whether she's on so i'll ask uh, it doesn't look question. like it yeah can't find thank her. you very much so um it's nice to see coordination it's nice to see coordination between different countries so uh, you've already shown us how you are coordinating with asm and i would uh, like to see that continuing across different continents so that we all work together and uh, improve on our studies and work together that's great um, there were a number of questions which may be a little bit of your repetition regarding how could we differentiate between some of those conditions and different types of B-lines. I won't go, uh, I won't ask those questions because you did actually ask, answer that during your talk. Instead, I'm going to ask uh, some interesting questions that come up. So I think for me, uh, doing our lung ultrasound here and other people doing lung ultrasound in different units, I would want to know what is the... Uh, uh, what is the inter-observer variation between a lung ultrasound? If we see one thing, would someone else come and see the same thing, or is it purely operator dependent, or are we sucking a, 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 a result out of our thumb? So how useful is the result, and is there some inter-observer uh, correlation? Would you know, would, can you tell that? Yeah, or not? Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks, Jan. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that whatever any any programs of the focus we all need to start interpreting images among our teams along with the additional teams when they are backing up so we all should be on the same platform that is the first important need of the any focus program it's not like that one thing i'm doing another person interpreting another thing third person interpreting in the same unit that should not happen we all need to follow the standard guidelines which has been designed for lung also, for eco also, for cranial ultrasound also. And those standard norms are there in those at the international level. That's what I showed you the uh, focus guidelines published in 2020 also for the lung, for the brain also. The inter uh, can be reduced by combining these things, interpreting these things that can be done and the people sitting together can be done. I would say that 10 to 20% would be there uh, differentiation, but once we learn together, then things will not be so difficult. And the lung is so easy. I, I think all, amongst the all, lung is the most easy. That's what my perception or the people who are, all are doing, that's what they feel. Thank you. I think I'll, I'll highlight that. I think it's very important that we all on the same page. And this is where training uh, programs come into play. And that, that's what you're doing in India. And that's what we are doing with ASM here. We're standardizing our ultrasound so that we all know what we're doing, uh, so that we don't have cowboys going out there thinking they know what they're doing. So we all standardize the, uh, the teaching. Thank you. I'm going to now separate uh, as probably my last two questions. I'm going to separate out these questions based on the country. So we've uh, we've had a look at what you do in India, and I'm really quite impressed by uh, your reliance on the ultrasound for diagnosing pneumonia and RDS, and that must be really helpful in your setting. Not so yeah. much for our settings. We very we very fortunate here. We've got different a different approach to this and we can give surfactant to babies that don't actually need it so we're very lucky so the first question is going to be more for the developing countries like uh, india to differentiate and that was uh, someone did ask a question and i'm sorry if i missed the name here there's a uh, meconium aspiration syndrome or pneumonia versus rds so you've already shown us that meconium aspiration syndrome and pneumonia are very similar you can't really differentiate those on like yeah, ultrasound yeah, yeah. but you can differentiate that from RDS. So just to remind us, you already did say that. How can you differentiate, how can you separate these two sections? Yeah, yeah. Very, well, very important points. For RDS, we are talking at a subpleural consolidation. We are talking about what we are talking as the whiteout lungs and subpleural consolidation. For the cases of the pneumonia, we are talking about hepatization. That means the lung looks like a liver parenchyma, 
and we are talking about the classic shred sign you will that's what the people once you start doing in, in this covid 19 it was so easy and so important when we are treating this neonatal covid along with some pediatric covid this pneumonia has helped us very well and in, immediately you can able to start treatment on that basis Wow, I'm fascinated. So you can actually, you had babies with COVID, and you could actually I, see I, signs I of blood alcohol. I, I will take one minute on this one. I have not shown, but we have the largest series of the neonatal COVID in Pune city, amongst the India. We had a total twenty-one newborn babies with the COVID nineteen, and we have, I think, we have published one article in Infection and. Uh, Two, one in BMJ case report and one is in the Indian Pediatrics about the importance about the neonatal COVID and association things also as a rare thing also. But I must openly say that that paper is not yet out about the COVID nineteen and lung ultrasound. But it is very use easy when you pick up this COVID nineteen pneumonia by lung ultrasound. And initially, the first wave we were worried to ship the ultrasound machine into the NICU, but In the second wave of India, April and May, we have encouraged the people to do the lung ultrasound with these babies, and we had a very good diagnostic features. Wow, that that opens many new questions and and options for us to think that we can help with that diagnosis. So I'm going to shift the uh, the concentration now to our uh, first world type country, where we uh, have a slightly different approach. Uh, sorry, sorry, a priority. For us and Dr. Archie Priya Darshi, who's now uh, one of my colleagues, but she also works at the Children's Hospital. She's written a comment here: Lung ultrasounds have good accuracy in prediction of uh, chronic lung disease at, uh, if done on day seven and day twenty-eight in extremely preterm infants. Now, I'm, I'm myself I'm not aware of that study. Uh, are you aware that that's a, that there can be a predictive value? Yes, yes, that's the one study. Uh, Professor Daniel Duluka has been uh, documented, and they are now they have commented that's the one study. But I, uh, in Indian setups, I have struggled. I must openly say that. But that is what we need to practice. These are the new things coming out in the last two three years. Now people are concentrating about the BPD. People are concentrating about associated BPD and pulmonary hypertension. So these are the new aspects where we can think about the future research also. And the collaborative research amongst all the countries. Okay, I see, Dr. Uh, Dr. Priyadar. She's very active here. She said, uh, if the lung scores are more than eight, so that means using a lung score, which Dr. Dilika would have defined in that paper. So thank you. So they, they can lung ultrasound can be used as a predictive tool for preterm yeah. babies that may uh, be predict their chronic lung disease. My next question would be. Um, And this is very a very good question because we all know, as neonatologists, the limited use of um, diuretics. And there's a nice Cochrane trial showing that uh, thiazide diuretics are not very helpful in terms of uh, uh, long-term outcomes, decreasing hospital stay or clinical course. Uh, whereas loop diuretics, short-term, may have a benefit. So some people still use diuretics routinely, whereas other people go by the Cochrane and say they're not helpful, and we're using pressure and other methods to help these babies. So what uh, what my question would be, uh, if we have a baby with chronic lung disease, would an ultrasound potentially a lung ultrasound be useful to predict which babies may benefit from diuretics or uh, which babies may sh- should go to say dexamethasone or pressure effects or other treatments i think it's a good research question for all of us this is the this is what we all need to now go ahead that we have been defined a lot of things about rds but now it's a time to define about bpd management of bpd and effect of the management of the bpd what we are using does it is impact so probably the um, these are the things now let's think about the future research on these angles so that's uh, very useful for all of us thank you uh, so yes that would be a place for future research i think but yeah. uh, another thing that's crossed my mind now and this only uh, occurred to me very recently We know. Uh, I don't know if you use high-frequency oscillatory ventilation in your unit. We do yeah. quite a lot in our unit, and for the yeah. people that do use high-frequency correctly, you will know uh, how to optimize uh, 
uh, the lung volume. And uh, Professor Tingi in Melbourne has written some nice papers on the recruitment maneuver to try and optimize the lung volumes. And uh, so that is in terms of the clinical recruitment maneuver. And I was thinking, once you get to the, the distension phase and you get to a, a max volume, would lung ultrasound maybe be useful with looking at decreased pleural movement or something? What would you say about lung ultrasound with high frequency? Yes, I, I, think, I think you see that when we see the lungs which is opening up, that means we want to see the transitional pattern. And once it is too much distension, then definitely there might be problem with the lung sliding. There might be problems with these ones. We don't know, but I think this is again another research question about the detection of all distension or detection of uh, 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 recruitment in cases of high frequency oscillation ventilation. That would be a good idea to see the serial monitoring when we talk about at one minute or 10 minutes and uh, 20 minutes as a serial four five ultrasound pictures. That will guide us a good idea when we consider uh, this as uh, another research question for the young ones, uh, we can think of it. I think those are all my questions, and we are tried to cover many of the questions. I didn't cover those. There were a few uh, that asked uh, that wanted to. Uh, maybe you can just as a last one say, is there a difference? Uh, can you show the difference between consolidation and collapse? To me, they mean the same thing, but uh, I don't know um, what. Okay, okay. I'll just uh, share the screen again. Let's ask the, uh, the person that asked that question um, whether they want to ask that question live. Oh, sorry. Okay, I'll just. Uh... Thank you. That uh, I realized that that was already covered by you, and that's why I left it till yeah, last. Thank you. That's what. That's what. Uh, so if you see this, this is the this is what we talk about the hepatization, and we we'll talk about the shear sign. And in cases of the atelectasis, what is the additional thing is we need to think. Uh, we need to see about. Sorry, just I'm just rushing this because of the time. You need to see the additional part as the sum fluid. Again, you will see the increased blood flow and associated findings that will guide us in these conditions. Okay, I think, yeah. I think the message is uh, lung ultrasound should not be taken by itself. We always have to remember there's a baby in front of us. We have to use the clinical scenario history if we have, and it becomes an adjunct to our treatment of our babies. And as you have proved to us, a very useful adjunct and in different countries that may not have surfactant or not a quick access to x-rays or antibiotics and things, this can become a really useful tool. So um, I have really learned a lot from this and I really value this. Thank you very much for a beautiful lecture. And uh, thank you everyone for participating. We had a really good turnout, over 100 people, 161 people. Isn't that amazing? So Dr. Uh, Oye, Dr. Julie, oh, Oye, you, you, you had more than that, Jan. Um, you had more than 200 and almost 230 people. So well That's done, amazing. guys. That was amazing. Um, you, and, yes, that was really good. I even learned something. So um, thank you. And uh, Dr. Pradeep has allowed us to post the um, link for the recording. Um, we'll get him to check it first to make sure no one's doing anything naughty on the recording. And if all good, yeah, we'll send it up. Thank you. Thank you very thank much, you. everyone. Take Bye. care. See you. Bye. Bye, everyone. See you in Pune, India. Sure. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Bye.